Welcome, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the Qatar Economic Forum. I'm Joanna Ossinger with Bloomberg News, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our panel, Post Blockchain Identity, What is the Next Generation of Security? So I've got a great panel with me, and hopefully we'll have some good takeaways for you. So let's just get started here. Um, Cybercrime losses are predicted to be up to $6 billion this year. So how might blockchain help secure our data? Naveen, why don't we start with you? Well, I mean, there's a couple of things uh, that could be done. I mean, clearly, you know, with, the dis with, with blockchain technologies, you know, traceability and, and tracking is, is, is primary benefit. Um, we've seen with obviously recent uh, attacks on utility grids um, and in, you know, and in not in, in sort of gas distribution and petroleum distribution, whatever you like, all of these kind of critical industries that uh, the ransomware attacks that have taken place have actually re re relied increasingly on uh, payment through blo through blockchain, through cryptocurrency. And so one of the things that, that could be done, and there's a question I think we could discuss as a group, is you know some, the investigators who are tracing these hackers because the payments tend to go by via, via the blockchain can there be more done you know to uh, to to track down payments and then bring bring hackers more to the forefront um, because there are obviously lots of you know there's a lot a lot of uh, crypto kind of or blockchain explorers who are you know who are tracing uh, who can be traced through this payment mechanism but then of course the whole purpose of 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 uh, crypto is and the blockchain is also to ensure that if you want to remain remain um, you know as, as we have to discuss whether the the reaches of the law can actually be extended and and this is where I think a lot of things are not really determined yet in the current legislation system so I think there's a lot that can be done uh, the question is how far do we want to take it anyone else want to weigh in. Yeah, I'm happy to, to jump in. I think Naveen raised an interesting point, and I think the, the public reporting around the uh, recent pipeline attack that you raised, um, there was a recovery of funds in that instance. Uh, I think the other part of blockchain here is, is identity um, and the use of blockchain for, for secure identity. That Now, sitting behind that, that's not something I've seen as widely adopted, uh, and I'd be interested to hear the views of, of the others around the table as to whether they've seen it in an enterprise environment. Um, but I think the key point there is sitting behind that is, is public key cryptography. Um, so the blockchain is one part of it. That's the, the kind of public end that offers you the kind of uh, availability, privacy, convenience. But it's not necessarily inherently secure. So I think in the second part of this question, I don't want to jump forward. Um, but, you know, when we talk about the next generation, you know, for me, it's all about the implementation. So sitting behind blockchain is public key cryptography cryptography and it's how well that's implemented the blockchain in and of itself isn't inherently secure um, so that was the, the point I wanted to add on yeah post blockchain uh, you know I think we have the what exists right now are really good ID cards almost but it's very binary your identity is good or bad but after this I think it's going to be more about posture and health that the identities that are involved and are compromised uh, it's less about are you a valid employee or you a valid user. It's going to be much more the posture and health. Have your has your identity been involved in you know bad activities in the last while? Have you been sending out uh, you know uh, malware and participation of ransomware? And this kind of you know posture and health that's going to be much more important. We have so much volume of storage now and information and telemetry we can collect that we can make really good assessments. Whereas today it's kind of good bad. I think in the future it's going to be a real time risk assessment for not only systems, identities, devices, but individuals as well. Yeah, if I could add, maybe just a little bit from, from a perspective from Visa and again, from a payments perspective, again, um, obviously blockchain and data security is critical in, in our space in regards to payments and, and the credentials that all the cardholders use and, and, and merchants that accept. Um, I think uh, beyond the technology, be it blockchain or other technology in regards to actually protect data, I think the what we believe is most critical is actually how do we actually devalue that actual information? Um, and that's where the, you know, we've slowly migrated over the years from, you know, static data as in the Max Drive to chip cards where it's dynamic. 
And then we're also in the e-commerce world moving more and more to tokens, something that is actually going to be that, you know, and we've seen already great use cases. You know, unfortunately, there is a compromise, but use, great use cases where the actual hackers have been able to go in, forensic companies are able to go in and prove that actually all the data that was stolen are tokens that actually no, provide no value. So in the future, our goal and, our, and my intention as being, you know, responsible for protecting the merchants in the SEMIA region for Visa is I don't want them to actually have to protect anything because I want everything that they actually hold not to have any value. And then really concentrate a very small group of people or entities that actually have valuable information. And then you use multiple different types of technologies to be able to actually secure that data. Uh, I, I want to comment, uh, Joanna, on, on Naveen's point uh, on, uh, on the blockchain and Bitcoin, and, and uh, certainly the increase of uh, of ransomware is, is mainly attributed to the ease of monetization of these attacks. Like attackers can get uh, paid uh, easier, easy, uh, easier than before. Uh, but I think this is not a blockchain problem per se. Uh, this is a Bitcoin's problem, yeah? because money can be made, uh, but the technology itself uh, is is a uh, is phenomenal in a way that will allow us to do a lot of other activities that weren't, weren't uh, available to us before, like the likes of NFTs, the like of integrity verification. And, I, and I'm sure probably uh, Alistair had, had, had a point in, in, in terms of incident response and collection of forensics evidence. This is, again, if, we, if we're going to put them on blockchain and preserve the identity and produce like, like certificates of, of like these evidence weren't tampered by anybody, this is, could really help uh, really pointing to the right guys or pointing to the to the criminals, uh, in, 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 in uh, specifically, uh, and there's also a point about the public uh, key uh, cryptography, which is rightly said by by Alistair, but I, but I think here is a blockchain. The phenomenon of blockchain is is though the identity plays a big part of it, but the connectedness of the blocks in a certain way you can trace back to to the to the inception of the blockchain. Uh, is is really phenomenal that you can really see the changes happen over time, and I think this is what, uh, as, as Naveen mentioned, in the recent attacks where uh, law enforcement were able to track payments because of this feature, they can see uh, transactions been made from party A to party B to party C, and they were able to seize and get the control over. So I think. Uh, from from the outset, I, I think it will have some uh, significant improvement once the adoption became mainstream uh, over the blockchain. I think just to, to kind of chime in on that and add to that as well. Um, I, yeah, I think both in terms of what's been discussed about uh, the use of blockchain for um, processing of, of payments by cyber criminals and the sort of internal use by identity. Um, the point I'd want to pick up on is that the sort of the fundamental challenges remain kind of invariant despite the technologies, right? So with the use of, of cryptocurrencies and blockchain and, and processing of payments, it's good old fashioned money laundering, right? I mean, the, the technology can be built to be uh, pretty, pretty great at traceability, but then people set up tumblers and they find ways to disrupt the flow and, and you can't really technologize that kind of risk out and with the internal identity piece the same sort of thing right like the weak link is always the identity issuer there's always some way you can have a wonderfully verifiable distributed framework for identity management that's fantastic but um the good old-fashioned social engineering manipulation of humans is always going to exist so i i think i was most sort of aligned with um, what greg was saying about i guess sort of a modest stance of saying that whatever we build with these it's not an easy solution and it's a sort of constant difficult task of verifying in as many ways as you can being as secure in as many ways as you can doing as much as you can to constantly um revalidate those identities and constantly do everything you can to mitigate risk throughout everything rather than just moments in time for um either traceability of transactions or establishing of identity yeah, and absolutely, if I could just agree and sort of re-emphasize on that, because I think one of the things we see is we, you know, we all here obviously love technology, it's what we do, and we get excited by new technologies, 
Um, but that adaptability and flexibility is also what we see amongst attackers. So you find some new method of security, they find some new method of undermining it and attacking. And to, to bring together some of the points from Khaled and Hector and Andrew, um, you know, if you have the blockchain, that's great. It's immutable. But if you lose your private key, which an attacker might uh, get to by targeting your device through social engineering, then they can, you know, they can impact the blockchain. They they effectively take control. And we see attackers using those types of attacks all the time. They understand where the weaknesses sit. And then last point, and I will uh, hand over, but, you know, to again, to pick up on the point from Andrew, effectively, this sort of strength in depth, you know, sometimes the term next gen, I think can be unhelpful. So going back, yes, we love technology, we love the next thing. But I think some people see it as a, as a mental crutch, oh, I just need the next gen of whatever to solve my problems. And actually, above all else, forget the technologies, doing the basics well is what's going to matter. So all the things that we've been talking about in the security industry for five or 10 years, multi-factor authentication, patching, segmentation, and we can go into more depth about recent attacks and how the lack of patching effectively would have stopped the majority of those, how multi-factor authentication would have stopped the majority of those. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't look at next gen and I, we can come on to what we think is the next gen. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't look at blockchain but if people see this as a mental crutch to move away from those basics, it's never going to solve the problems. Okay, so actually that gets into something. Um, best practice takeaways from real world incidents. So you mentioned a few of those. Um, what are some takeaways, uh, mistakes that you feel companies made or things that they did well? I think number one is always to uh, patch and back up. That those two things will stop 99.9% you know, of attacks. But uh, you know, again, attackers realize uh, you know where the weak points are. And and now with approximately one out of six dollars being spent on technology outside the technology organization, this shadow IT or types of technology that aren't directly controlled by the you know the CIO and other technology leaders. Um, these kinds of new approaches of having better visibility in the organization about what's happening in real time, and, and especially for devices that that can't be uh, that can't be managed easily. You know, during the last year during COVID, with work at home, uh, so many employees and staff were working on shared devices or devices that we would have never trusted before inside our enterprises. And that kind of real time flexibility and gathering large amounts of data and trying to protect as best we can the stuff we have, but also protecting the stuff that we think we have. Uh, that we don't control well is going to have to be part of that equation. Yeah, I yeah. would just echo what Alistair and, and Greg said. I, you know, I think, you know, from, a, again, when we see the compromises that we see in the payment system, be it what we call ATM cash out attacks or other type of e-commerce compromises, again, it, it is the basics. You know, most of the times, one of the things that we're seeing, two growing trends in regards to the fraud space our well social engineering, which was also addressed, you know, mentioned by Andrew. And so, again, one of the the things that we are focused on more and more is again it, it, with that growing move to digital and with the pandemic, it was just accelerated. Is how do we actually do again going back to the authentication and identity of who's actually buying the things? Um, the other trend we're seeing uh, significantly, and it continues to be something, is insiders. Um, insiders continue to play a, a significant role in regards to being able to be manipulated and sharing credentials um, um, in regards to the hackers that we see in the payment system. Yeah, maybe I can just add, I mean, we we did a study on, on this uh, very recently on sort of the, what were the practices most strongly correlated with overall security resilience, if you like. And, you know, the, the, the single largest factor was uh, around proactive um, refreshing of existing technology, I think, to the point uh, that was raised by Alistair earlier. It's, it's not just about new technology. It's about, you know, what you already have and just, you know, you know patching and, and making sure that everything is up to date. Uh, I think the other and that was that was associated with a 12.7 percent increase in probability of success. We looked at like, you know, thousands of, of companies across the world. And that was uh, through the work that you know our MFA team did. The um, the other thing is like and and this is something I just want to kind of throw out there is that 
we, we're constantly surprised, if you like, when, when an attack happens, but we also, many of us know that attacks are going to happen. So, you know, I think it was John Chambers that said back in 2015, there, there are two types of companies. There's a company that's been attacked and a company that, that, that thinks they haven't been attacked. You know, that everyone's going to get attacked, basically. Everyone is attacked. So I'm just surprised that there's constantly almost surprised whenever there is an attack. And especially as you start to industrialize and put in place operational technologies together with information technologies and start to expand your footprint of sensors and tech and, and you know, edge equipment that is basically connecting to your core, especially in utility industries and you know other kind of manufacturing industries where all of a sudden your devices are like expanding like exponentially. And then there is there is very little information sharing and very little board level oversight, even at the side at, at, at the at the management board level. There's you know the audit committee you know the, the 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 emphasis on integrating IT strategy and OT strategy as as a coordinated strategy as opposed to siloed organizational constructs. So there's lots and lots of things that can be done, and we all know they have to be done. Like it, it, threat intelligence sharing should be done, but there's still and that's what the hackers do all the time. They share their information very very effectively. So I'm not. I'm almost like, in a way, just to be provocative, I'm almost like losing a bit of sympathy here because, you know, it's about time, actually, that some of these practices were put into place. Anyone want to follow that up? Um, I guess I'll, I'll just add on to that to sort of agree and, and a little bit challenge it, I guess, which is um, Maybe it's just because I work in the industry, so I'm a bit jaded now. So, and I talk to people who thankfully have got the message that they should expect to, if not having already been attacked, be attacked. But what I find is that the lesson is learned in one domain, and then they make the same mistake of assuming that they'll be secure by design in a new domain. So people I talk to have kind of got the point now that when they're thinking about like on-prem data structure, infrastructure, and, and old school networked environments, they say things like, yeah, well, obviously, it's always possible that there's malware on my systems. But then I talk to them about their DevOps in the cloud, and they say to me, oh, no, we follow like an immutable infrastructure pattern. And so it's impossible for our VMs or our containers to be compromised. We just don't, we don't need to worry about detection because it's secure by design. Uh, or they say the same thing with identity. They say like, you know, our, our centralized identity provider means that uh, the identity piece isn't a vector for attackers to, to go after. So I think... People do get the message, but there's always this temptation or worry, uh, well, no, temptation, not worry, to think that in some new domain, uh, detection and the hard work of constant like log scrutiny and a SOC will somehow not be necessary anymore. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to just jump on that if that's okay for a second. So I think that raises the really interesting point. So having established that foundation, which I think we're all agreed on that the basics are the important, um, you know, Andrew mentions a couple of trends, so cloud adoption, um, but I think also the sort of hybrid environment and remote working. So that's partially being forced by uh, COVID-19, but it's also was a trend that was accelerating anyway. And what that leads to is in increased complexity. So it's an increased complexity of your environment and then interconnection. So, you know, do I authenticate direct to the cloud or do I authenticate to my network and then back out? Um, so there are a couple of um, key, you know, next gen, if you like, technologies that I think are going to be key in the next few years. So we've got um, the things like SASE, so Secure Access Service Edge. And I think we're also going to see a lot more about zero trust. So to Andrew's point and a lot of the points raised where you're looking at accessing individual resources, individual systems, individual applications, and there's always a context, a security context around that. Uh, individual access, and that can be facilitated by SASE, and that also can um, help for this uh, subject matter be linked back to identity and blockchain if you wanted to incorporate that. But you know, the zero trust architecture, I think, is is going to be one of the key developments in the near future. We have these new architectures, and uh, you know, there's 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 good opportunities there. So you know, the zero trust is a great sort of uh, you know ability to make a smaller petri dish when you look through the microscope with greater telemetry that you're collecting to uh, reduce the attack surface. But I think there's now with the 
increase we've seen in the sophistication of the attack groups, that this is no longer the small groups and the sophistication and the amount of economic impact we're seeing is significant. So there's increasingly a role for governments now not only to help organizations, especially the small and mid-sized ones, which are the most vulnerable, um, and small organizations such as state and local governments, uh, but also to cooperate for information sharing and to put more pressure, as we saw in the most recent pipeline attack, uh, on these groups. Um, if there's uh, too much, if they're operating with too much levels of comfort as they are now, operating almost in the light of day, uh, that's a role, I think, for governments and information sharing to happen and put more pressure uh, not only on the supply of the money that they're, they're, they're changing when they're money laundering, uh, but also on the groups themselves um, and put more pressure on them to uh, get out of this business and possibly into something else. Yeah, and I absolutely agree with that. And I think it goes beyond information sharing. I think that that's something that's been developing over a decade. I think we have to get to operational cooperation. So there is an absolute onus on victims. So to not sit back and say, why isn't law enforcement doing something about this? Why isn't government doing something about this? Are you reporting your attacks and are you cooperating with law enforcement and government agencies? And it becomes extremely complex. So as Greg raises, even um, criminal attacks, if you look at ransomware and extortion attacks, um, those are conducted by groups in certain geographies. And for instance, you might see those groups set exclusions in their malware to avoid deploying on Russian language systems, for instance. So a criminal attack has a political element because governments can influence them. Um, but then vice versa, the victims need to cooperate with their law enforcement. And there needs to be a, a good think at government level about how you conduct investigations and operations that cross borders in every single case. OK, so what are governments doing well? Um, are there any examples you can give of a government that really did something well or governments that kind of um, missed an opportunity to help? So I can speak directly in regards. So I'm, I'm based here in, in Dubai and UAE. And you know, in regards to that collaboration with law enforcement and so on and government, uh, we've been working and partnering very closely with the Dubai police and in, in developing a cyber fusion center where there's going to be multiple parties participating from the industry, the financial institutions, the payment networks and so on. And so that information sharing and collaboration, but also that second step. And, and, and I think that's critical. Many times, I think with ransomware, it's a lot more visible to compromise. But I could tell you from comp, you know having to deal with compromise over the last 18 years with many of the largest hit, uh, compromises in the U.S., um, it, it took us many, many conversations to be able to actually convince that entity that they actually were compromised. Because the first thing that, that gets in their mind is, how do I actually I protect myself and my reputation? And so many times it's denial, denial, denial. And then you have to come with the proof and the evidence to be able to demonstrate. So ransomware is a little bit, too, you know, very evident than other type of data compromises. It, that's a big challenge. And I think so. I think I agree, very agree with Alistair. The fact that people have to take that perspective of, you know, if if it in, indeed you are compromised or you believe to be compromised, you have to start acting and and you have to put aside your, you know, how to protect yourself and your potential reputation. And I, I can follow up to the, the questions, well, John. I, I think I agree. I think um, in the I was based in the UAE, and the government there, uh, Dubai Police, um, TDRA, and others, they're doing a lot around this cooperation. There are other governments um, around the world who are, but they're in pockets. And I think one of the um, so without then naming a series of other governments, I think one of the key aspects is that multilateral organizations have a significant role to play because a national government can only do so much when every case, and you know, if I take the most simplistic cyber type case, maybe a cyber bullying, that might happen between two neighbors, but it goes via a, a server in a third party country, which is where the evidence is sitting. So every cyber case has this international element that crosses borders and you need evidence collection. So multilateral organizations such as the EU, Europol, Interpol, they all have um, a significant role to play. And we need to look at how you expedite things like evidence collection across borders. Uh, I want to add uh, a point here, uh, uh, Joanna, uh, especially on the uh, on the government role. Uh, here in Qatar, uh, there is uh, in the host of World Cup uh, 2022, 
And, uh, and there has been uh, a, an effort by the government to secure or to put, the, to put entities on a tight deadline for them to basically be secure. And this has facilitated a lot of procurement activities and facilitated a lot of guidance to the entities to be there on time. And I think this is what, what the government can really do because they can control their constituents. Uh, but once it goes across border, it becomes ex extremely difficult for cooperation yeah? because there are, I mean, we know that the internet has been weaponized. There have been attacks uh, attributed to countries to deter, to deter different countries. And the internet was built on anonymous. Uh, so, so it's very hard for them to attribute to, to a certain party or a certain uh, body. And this is a long shot. Yeah? Uh, I think cooperation will certainly take us a long way. Uh, industry across uh, uh, cooperation will take us a long way, but will not be effective solution, so to speak. I think what the government can really focus on, a priority, is securing their own constituents and making sure that they do their job right. I, I echo what my colleagues said here, like following the basics, like do your patches on time, know what you have, like inventory, and do some basic monitoring that will help you to will help you to do these will help you to go take you a long way across the threat profile. Like some of the threats will be able to, to, to find and block, and some you need to really cooperate with others for you uh, for you to have. So back back again, I think the government can really be much more effective in controlling what they can control, which is their constituents. We also have a, you know, standards that are emerging now or technology we know is coming towards us that we can start to secure now and governments can 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 take a large role in helping make sure that that is, uh, you know, good for many countries, not just the technology, uh, you know, developers that are making them. So, for example, 6G standards are already starting to emerge and there's going to be a great divide once uh, quantum crypto uh, becomes an issue, uh, you know, once we once we you know, are we all quantum safe? So once uh, quantum computing comes forward, a lot of cryptography is, you know, potentially in danger. And that quantum readiness, you know, we can start looking at that now. In fact, many, you know, governments are doing that. But that's going to be a great divide between the haves and the have-nots for very advanced countries uh, are going to be ready first and will be smaller targets. And, uh, you know, when that technology changes, you know, you know in a great shift, um, there's going to be many countries who may need assistance with that. So once again, you know, technology sharing, but also preparing up front for changes that we know are potentially in the near future. Yeah, I think maybe one one thing I want to add about, I don't, I'm not sure which governments are doing this, but I can say what we are lobbying with governments to do uh, to support us on is in like two areas. One is on ensuring, you know, appropriate kind of standards across countries, because it's one thing you know, because cybersecurity is obviously uh, cross-border by nature, right? But so it's all great if one country can 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 set in place proper standards and processes and compliance, which tends to be a focus. But it's not great if the neighboring country doesn't have you know similar guidance. So that's one one issue. The other issue is like when governments think about, you know, can th are thinking about um, um, managing the cyber cyber risk. There are so many different domains, and I think just trying to get that across and trying to make that built into directives and legislation is quite important. Like, for example, personal information is one domain that has to be regulated and that's or, or has to be enabled uh, to be protected and, and transparent and account. People should have accountability for it. But that's very different to say cybersecurity information or industrial control system data or critical infrastructure, as we've talked about with the pipelines. And then when you start to look at cloud services, supply chain, digital payments, online content, you know, uh, EI, you know, e-commerce, e or even like AI, ML, big data, IoT data, it all requires different forms of, um, they're all different forms of data that need different levels of sophistication in order to protect. So you can protect on a, on a, on a, on a pure infrastructure layer or a, or a network layer. But in many cases, most of the applications, you know, most of the data is being held at the application layer. So we need to look at the data in a very, in a very nuanced way. And that's something that I'm not seeing enough thinking, at least cross-border thinking going on with governments. Okay, so are there industries that are at greater risk 
um, and what are the solutions or is kind of everyone at an equal risk? Well, it's where it's where you get the most disruption, right? I mean, I, I guess whatever whatever creates the most chaos is probably the most likely industry to be disrupted. So, I mean, if you can disrupt financial sector, or you, or you can disrupt, you know, energy and oil and gas and and power and and utility grids, then obviously you'd think that that would be the most logical place to go if you were a hacker. But um, yeah, I, I don't think it's one or the other. It's also where I think there's also a willingness to pay. Uh, for ransomware, and you know, and there are some companies that are more willing than less and, and to pay than others. So, it also depends on that as well. Yeah, I think you know, maybe I kind of take it. I think there's industries and sectors that, let's say, your life or somebody's life is more um, linked and dependent on, uh, you know, healthcare, a hospital not being able to take care of people's and uh, their lives and you know surgeries or whatever you, you want to call it is a little bit more threatening than yeah yeah you can lose you know if i look at it from a financial perspective you can lose a little bit some money and yeah it could have a financial impact from from one point of view but it's not necessarily a life threatening industry so so i think there are definitely sectors and in industry that um, have more critical importance um, to to again the government and from in different industries yeah, just to kind of join in on that. Um, obviously, we're we're all kind of the most concerned about critical infrastructure, and it has been highly targeted recently. But I do think if you look at what happened with the pipeline, um, Darkside, the group in that case, did seem to get genuinely spooked by the level of response they provoked from the Biden administration. And if we're thinking about nation state activities, obviously they have all sorts of motives to attack critical infrastructure. But if you're talking about organized crime, they just want to be able to ransom operations, right? And if you can ransom a manufacturing plant or you can ransom a pipeline, it's a very effective way to disrupt services. You're not just relying on data being valuable, but you're disrupting ongoing operations. So that's why that appeals to them. But I think the category of targets that that's true of is growing every week. Right? If you think about the way organizations are now structured with remote work, there are so many opportunities now for almost every sector to have their infrastructure disrupted in a way that kills the core function of their business. So if I was a, if I was a dark side or a soda or one of these groups, I don't need to go after critical infrastructure that will provoke a governmental response. I can target almost any organization now and disrupt their ability to connect into their centralized infrastructure from their remote workers and potentially achieve similar levels of leverage over organizations for much less inflammatory targets. So I would be concerned about the proliferation of those methods down to SMEs who are now vulnerable with remote working infrastructure in that way. Yeah, and I think it's an interesting dynamic, but I think over the last 12 months, we have seen this pivot where a, a number of criminal groups have overstepped, as Andrew said, um, pipeline healthcare. Um, so you've now got a number of criminal groups publicizing the fact that they will not target healthcare as if you know that makes them a better criminal um, because they're very conscious of this overlap whereby there can be a political reaction to criminal activity um, and again back to Andrew's point you know the dynamics here when you talk about the different verticals the different industries they, they do get extremely complex um, there are five or six industries that feature fairly heavily um, because when you look at nation states, they've got set objectives, they change relatively slowly, and your level of security doesn't impact. So if, if country X wants to gain access to information on advanced telecommunications, they don't change their mind because it's difficult, they find a new way in. So they're always going to be uh, targeting advanced telecommunications. If you're a criminal, you want the best return on investment. So actually, you're going for the people that can pay, but with the least effort to get in. Uh, and that's where, you know, back to your own security, you can have the greatest impact on that type of activity, which can potentially be the most disruptive. Yeah, I think it's going to uh, change as well. Uh, it's going to evolve, uh, absolutely. You know, we've seen in the past where, you know, the price of uh, Bitcoin would drive attacker behavior. For example, they would go more towards using resources when the price of Bitcoin was high rather than ransomware. Uh, and we're going to see pivots again. So uh, I think it's very feasible that if, or, if some regions have, for example, uh, you know, tax deductions on ransomware payments, 
or um, you know, some organizations who have cyber insurance will become greater targets. We're going to see those kinds of evolutions. Um, but I think we're also going to see a change that, uh, you know, everybody's a target and it's continued. It used to be very sort of, you know, industry specific or vertical specific. And I think that's gone away now. Uh, and I think we're going to see an evolution in targeting. Okay, so what are some of the most exciting innovations happening in security right now? I think for, for me, it's the uh, the use of, of cloud for storage to collect massive amounts of information that we never could collect before in terms of telemetry or information about attacks to take small breadcrumbs and uh, join them together. Whereas previously we needed, you know, you know, a, sm a, a very, uh, you know, a small amount of information we're very sure about. So there's new kinds of advances. So uh, XDR is uh, is one term that's used for collecting large amounts of telemetry to, to follow attackers. But I think also new architectures, which was mentioned by, you know, Alistair, for example, with, uh, you know, zero trust to, uh, you know, change, change how we're looking at things. So lower the attack surface, which is uh, zero trust and getting a, a bigger microscope to look at that smaller Petri dish, which is technologies like XDR and related ones to gather more information. Yeah, I'd like to see. I mean, I'm I, I like I'm I'm tracking sort of carefully the developments around passwordless, um, you know, and context and user context and device context and how you know multi-layered security can actually be put in place so that you know in real time a device, a user, or you know, a workload, a worker, or a workplace can be authenticated in real time, um, and therefore enabling. Uh, you know, access to information depending on, uh, you know, least privileged uh, sort of uh, rules, right? So I think, I think there's a lot of work being done in that space, and particularly uh, as we, you know, all start working all over the place remotely, and as we start to bring on more devices onto, um, onto networks, uh, it's going to be absolutely critical. You know, identity has to be correlated triangulated in real time with a device with an application with a user with uh, uh, with with uh, at, at lightning speed so um, you know and 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 if you've already been authenticated with through biometrics um, and, and 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 that enables you to access other resources with the same levels of permission then you know it, it also improves the user experience and the customer experience of it so passwordless to me is is probably one of the most interesting developments. I'm not saying that it's going to solve everything, but I'm just saying it's very interesting development for the future. Okay, I, so I, go ahead. So I, was just, um, I, I guess was going to introduce a note of caution, which you'd expect from, from the security industry, I think. With, you know, Cloud is, again, development's accelerating, very exciting. And, you know, we've gone from compute to containers to serverless. Um, but as ever, I think the security framework around that is slightly lagging. So Greg's mentioned XDR, um, but if you look at EDR, which is a sort of, the, you know, the foundation stone of that, the granularity you can get on an on-premises system or even a virtual machine is now massive. You can get any data you want. If you look at what's available within the cloud, most of the security solutions are primarily around configuration. And actually, currently, most of the issues are around posture and configuration. Um, but as cloud adoption increases, attacker focus on it will increase, and the level of kind of detail that you need to collect within cloud native solutions um, will also increase. And I think right now, we don't have the number of solutions and the depth of visibility uh, in cloud, and particularly in the kind of extreme end, if you like, the sort of um, container and serverless that we do anywhere near as we do on-premises. Um, so that's going to be a kind of huge development for the security industry. Okay, so um, does anyone have advice for the audience here? Anything that you think people really need to be doing, things they need to be thinking about for their companies? I think to just come off the back of what Alistair was saying, I'm always very wary, given that I'm a representative vendor and giving advice that just sounds like transparently commercial. So to try and not do that, what I would say is I think 
the fragmentation of the business across different cloud services is a huge problem. Um, and picking up on what Naveen was saying about bringing, tying lots of things together, um, uh, the idea that we need more maturity in cloud, I would, my one big bit of advice would be to organizations to try and make sure that whatever your security solutions look like, whether it's preventative, detection, response, whatever, to try and do everything you can to reassemble those fragments of the business, if you like, into one consolidated picture understanding and like framework and responding to stuff so that you're dealing with every cloud service environment as part of one strategy. I think that's the biggest challenge that the organizations I work with face. It's just too fragmented at the minute. I would just say that, you know, as as I think early on, um, I think Alistair, somebody mentioned, you know, authentication is going to be critical. And I mean, I think mentioned also, you know, an identity, digital identities are going to be critical. And so I think um, key areas and, and things that we think about are is, you know, again, how do we make sure that every every system that is being developed is interoperable? Um, and then there has to be, while there is st standards that, that are created and, and like we create many standards in regards to data security, I think a, a lot of it comes down to the rules and the actual regulations associated with that. So as more of these identity, um, trusted identity kind of platforms are created, you know, who takes responsibility and liability associated with the different parties and the reliability and and if, if am I'm a, a um, you know an entity that is actually identifying and providing an identity provider and, and somebody's reliant, who takes that responsibility if the information is incorrect? And so I think that is going to be something that is going to be important as we continue to move um, to authentication and identity as being something critical for the future. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably say two two things. I mean, not 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 sort of like technology related, but more process related things. Um, one is I would say if you've been hacked or if you've been attacked by a cyber criminal, um, please obviously report it and share as much threat intelligence uh, information that you've picked up with uh, with the authorities or with third parties or with the vendors who are operating in your environment so that the more information that you share on, 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 the, on the threat, the more intelligence you share, the better it is overall for, for companies. Um, there's a general, I mean, in, in this part of the world where I'm in, I'm in, I'm in Southeast Asia, there's a general sense of shame, you know, when still, when, when you've been attacked. And so that is absolutely nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, we're expecting everyone has been attacked already by now. And so that's just, just a norm. Um, the second thing I would say is go get your uh, if you're if you're a, if you're a security researcher or you're a, a person in the organization that's you know tasked with protecting the organization, go and like ask your to meet your management team or the board and ask them you know to be trained on security fundamentals uh, or even advanced security or even ask them to be certified in new security technologies themselves. I mean, it's not, I don't think it's enough for management teams to manage. Uh, I think they need to be also understanding and, and enforcing policy and therefore they need to be leading by example and learning about the technology to start with. So that that's another thing I would do if I was junior in the organization and protect. Anyone have have any other thoughts? Any any last wrap up comments? Um, I think what I'm not excited about is any sort of approaches that are going to involve uh, loading up people more or find anything that's going to require more people to solve it. Um, you know, it's, we've talked about the role of governments. Uh, you know, I think that's going to be a, a a great you know sea change for us. But anything that's going to rely on just you know bombarding people just you know, buying a bunch of technology that's going to overload the staff we have already today. That's not the solution. That's like taking too many vitamins. Uh, that's not going to work. So instead, these new kinds of approaches, that's going to have to change because definitely, you know, the threat landscapes change. The technology landscape is shifting beneath our feet today. Um, and if we don't want more of the same, we're going to have to try different approaches. Uh, I want to add also on uh, on my colleague's point, uh, 
uh, especially on my advice to other security colleagues is, is basically stick to the basics. Yeah, like uh, do your patches on time, know what you have, uh, make sure you have enough budget for you uh, to launch and do your security program. Don't address this from from pure technology perspective, like just buying the latest and greatest technologies and dumping them. Uh, technology is often said as people, technology, process, right? So we need to make sure that we tackle this from all these areas. And uh, and this is not a trivial task. Yeah? It is very hard for CISOs to be to be secure or to give the assurance, but uh, but but sticking to the basics will take you a long way. Okay, great. And I think we'll probably need to leave it there. Thank you so much to the audience for listening and um, have a great day.